أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters and friends let me begin by first thanking Imperial College London's Islamic Society for inviting me today and giving me the honour to deliver this brief address to you all about a very important topic and one amongst many important to topics which is affecting the Muslim community and that is the concept of justice in Islam. Now before we even attempt to begin whether these two things are inseparable entities, we first must ask ourselves a very important question and that is why are we even discussing this? Why are we even discussing the centrality or the alleged centrality of justice within Islam? And the truth be told is that the reason why we're discussing the concept of justice amongst many other topics, be it jihad, be it sharia, be it women's rights, is because Islam is being widely presented as a worldview and a religion which is essentially oppressive, unjust and backward. And many of its values, beliefs, rituals are perceived as archaic, outdated and regressive. In addition to this undeniable reality, we also find ourselves in a situation where increasing number of Muslims are seeking definitions of Islamic concepts elsewhere. And we know that at a time where it is very fashionable and trendy to be part of a number of social justice causes, we are seeking our definitions and our paradigms from uh, ideologies and philosophies that are alien to Islam, and if you scratch beneath the surface, you'll find that it is in uh, clear contradiction to the Islamic uh, framework and ethical uh, moral framework. So it is in this context that I understand that we are having this conversation today. Why else would you have chosen the concept of justice to be discussed from an Islamic perspective? Now, before I proceed with today's uh, presentation, it is important to understand how the concept of justice fits into Islam. And generally speaking, it has been agreed upon by the jurists and the scholars that justice, or is known as Adl, in Islam is centered around three things. Rights, which is then broken into two things, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rights of mankind. Responsibilities of institutions, governments, individuals, whatever it may be, and then retribution. What happens in the case when rights and responsibilities are either transgressed upon or abandoned? This is how generally the concept of justice falls into the Islamic paradigm. Rights, responsibilities, and retribution. I want to cite to you all some verses from the Quran and some prophetic statements which emphasizes the centrality and the importance of justice within Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Muntahana, Allah does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of religion and do not expel you from your homes, from being righteous towards them and acting justly towards them. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves, your parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So follow not your inclination, lest you not be just. Allah says in the same verse, Verily Allah commands you to render trust to whom they are due, and when you judge between people, to judge with justice. And Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, or you have believed, be persistently standing firm for Allah, witnesses in justice, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just. That is nearer to righteousness. Allah says in Surah An-Nahl, Verily, Allah orders justice and good conduct and giving to relatives, and He forbids immorality and bad conduct and oppression. In a hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Verily, 
Those who were fair will be in the presence of Allah upon pulpits of light, near the right hand of the merciful, the exalted, and both of his sides are right, those who practice justice in their rulings and with their families and in all that they did. This hadith in Sahih Muslim. In another hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an, the Prophet said, Whoever seeks to be a judge over the Muslims, such that he acquires it and his justice outweighs his tyranny, he will have paradise. However, if his tyranny outweighs his justice, he will have hellfire. Mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawood. In another hadith narrated by Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an, the Prophet said, Whoever has three qualities has completed the faith. A sense of fairness in yourself, spending in charity despite difficult circumstances, and offering peace to the world. This hadith was mentioned in Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba. These are just some verses of the Quran and some prophetic statements which explicitly emphasize the importance and the centrality of justice within Islam. There are many others. There are many others which are very direct and very explicit and there are others which are quite indirect and not so explicit. In fact, all the verses of the Quran and all the prophetic statements which talk about oppression whether it be the oppressed or the oppressor, is alluding to the concept of justice because the opposite of justice is injustice and oppression. However, it's all good and well. It's all good and well for me to reel off verse after verse and hadith after hadith about justice in Islam without actually understanding how these verses and these uh, prophetic statements actually manifested within Islamic civilization. But before I get to that, it's also very important that justice in Islam has two dimensions. Dimension and realm number one, this life. Dimension and realm number two, the hereafter. And there are three types of justice. There's the justice which is between mankind from an individual basis. How you deal with your friends, your neighbor, your family, and those around you, how you deal with yourself, that your own body has rights over you, and whether you are just or unjust in terms of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rest of society. Another type of justice is social justice. Some ulama, in fact many ulama throughout contemporary and classical have consistently said that this justice is perhaps the most important and is one which is systematic. The laws, the institutions, the prohibitions, the commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have set out for mankind. This is to do with how society is governed and how the affairs of mankind is governed. And last but not least, it is the justice of the hereafter. And that's Allah's justice. Now Allah's justice may well meet I may be delivered in this life, but without a shadow of a doubt, it will be fulfilled in the hereafter at a time when all disputes will be resolved. Let's look at some examples from Islamic history. Because if we were to engage non-Muslims, whether it be in our Dawa stores or our peers or our friends, and we can you know, cite some of the verses that I've just mentioned or some of the statements of the Prophet Wasallam, they can easily counter by saying, okay, that's all good and well. But give me some examples about how these central tenets and values manifested for our Islamic civilization. Example number one. After the Battle of Badr, there were many prisoners of war from Quraysh that were taken to Medina. And whilst they were held captive, they were given sustenance, bread and dates, in which even the Qurayshi prisoners were discussing amongst themselves. They have, the Muslims have given us better bread and better dates than the ones which they're consuming. It was narrated in the seerah that the Sahaba, they gave the prisoners of war, men who had fought them and killed their companions, better bread and better dates than the ones which they were consuming themselves. Example number two, during the conquest of Makkah, when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was breached by Quraysh, and the Prophet sallallahu wasallam came to, Medi uh, came to Makkah with around 10,000 soldiers. The people of Makkah feared 
that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was seeking retribution. He was seeking revenge. That it was going to be a day of slaughter. One could even argue that there was a basis for the Prophet to have even taken this action. Why? Because it was the people of Makkah who persecuted the Muslims, who oppressed them, who tortured them, who exiled them, who boycotted them, who waged war against them, who breached a treaty with the Muslims. Yet when Rasulullah entered Makkah and he gathered the people of Makkah around him and he asked them, what do you think I will do today? And they said that you will show mercy because we have always known Muhammad to be a man of mercy. And indeed that is what the Prophet did. He granted safety and security explicitly to the house of Abu Sufyan. Now, even though he explicitly mentioned Abu Sufyan, who was the leader of Quraysh at that time, he extended security to all the pagans of Mecca because Abu Sufyan was their leader. And anyone who was upon the religion of Abu Sufyan was given safety and security. And even the Sahaba at that time were baffled. They, were, they, they questioned the Prophet, why are we showing mercy? Why are we not seeking retribution for the many wrongdoings that they had done against us? Yet Rasulullah had that wisdom to see the future and within years the entirety of Makkah had accepted Islam. When we look at Umar an's treaty, his treaty in Jerusalem, which protected and preserved the rights of the Christians, which is still cited by academics and historians today to have been an embodiment of religious tolerance at that time that had not been witnessed anywhere else in the world. Anywhere else in the world, for centuries even after that, where the rights of the dhimmis, the people of the book, the non-Muslim citizens of the Islamic State, were afforded rights and security like no other place on earth. And where did this treaty find its basis from? From the hadith of the Prophet where he said, the one who harms a dhimmi has harmed me. And there are other narrations where the Prophet ﷺ said that the one who transgresses the rights of the dhimmi, I will take him to account on the day of judgment. The centrality and the importance of the protection of non-Muslim citizens within Islamic societies is something which was safeguarded and upheld for centuries. Even the rules of jihad, even rules pertaining to military engagement and warfare is centered around justice and mercy. And I'm going to give you eight rulings which there is a near consensus when it comes to military engagement. Rule number one, there is a clear prohibition of the killing of women and children. There is a clear prohibition of killing non-combatants, be it monks, priests, workers and the elderly. There is a prohibition of killing the disabled and the sick. There is a prohibition of mutilating the dead bodies of combatants. So you're not allowed to mutilate the bodies of the people that you're fighting. We have to show, we have to show mercy to combatants who willingly surrender. We have to treat prisoners of war with dignity, like we saw in the example of Badr and many other wars that followed after. You cannot even cut trees and kill animals without a legitimate reason. And last but not least, there is no compulsion in faith when it comes to taking prisons. There is no forced conversion. Brothers and sisters, these are just eight rules of jihad fi sabilillah and military engagement that were revealed and established 1400 years ago. Think about it for a moment with regards to modern warfare. Think about Iraq. Think about Afghanistan. Think about World War I and World War II. Were any of these things regarded as sacred? Whether it is enacted by non-Muslim armies or the armies of Muslim majority countries, none of these sacred rules and laws were ever respected. Forget about respecting the life of the elderly and the sick and the children. Right? Hospitals and civilian populations are specifically targeted in today's modern warfare. Where even the rules of engagement of jihad, a concept which has been bastardized in our times, one which has become synonymous with terrorism, violence, mindless criminality. Yet, there are profound rulings, strict rulings, when it comes to military engagement, which is centered around justice and mercy. 
Another example, when Ali was the Khalifa of the Muslims, he was once walking through the marketplace and he saw a Christian man with an armor which he believed was his. Remember, this is the Khalifa of the Muslims, perhaps one of the most powerful men on earth at that time. He took the Christian man to the Islamic courts and there was a very famous judge called Qadi Shurey and, there, and the mediation began. Qadi Shurey said to Ali radiallahu an, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ali radiallahu an immediately said, do not refer to me as Amir al-Mu'mineen because I fear you may favor me because of my position. So he said, Ya Abu Hassan, bring forth your witnesses against this man to claim that this armor is yours. When Ali radiallahu an's witnesses were not regarded as uh, Enough to have won the case, the Christian man won that case. This story is narrated in Ibn Kathir's Al Bidaya wal Nihaya. But the fact that a Christian man, a Dhimmi, a non Muslim citizen, was taken to the Islamic courts by the Khalifa himself and he lost that case shows the level of balance and mercy and justice within the Islamic legal code. Moving on some centuries forward. And we look at the liberation of Jerusalem by Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahimahullah. And we compare how he entered Jerusalem to how the Crusaders took Jerusalem 97 or 95 years prior to that. Chroniclers have consistently testified, both on the Muslim and the non-Muslim side. Even Crusader chroniclers have said that when, the, when we entered Jerusalem, there was a bloodbath. We smashed babies' heads against the walls. We raped women. We killed them. We slashed pregnant women. We smashed their fetuses. There was a bloodbath in Masjid al-Aqsa where they said that the blood had come up to the knees. It was a bloody affair. Three to five days of genocide. Yet when Salahuddin al-Ayyubi rahimahullah entered Jerusalem, yes, he fought passionately against the Knights Templars. But those crusaders who wanted to leave without war, he gave them safe passage. And those Christians that remained within Jerusalem, he did not implement attacks on them. In addition to that, he welcomed back the Jews who were exiled by the Crusaders. Compare that to how the Crusaders took Jerusalem 90 or 100 years prior to that. Again, was there not a basis? Was there not a basis for Salahuddin Ayyubi to seek retribution, to have sought revenge? But he didn't. Because the justice of Islam taught him that it was better to show mercy to the residents, the Christian residents of Jerusalem, and to get safe passage to those who fought him. When we look at Muslim Spain towards its decline, when the Castilian monarchs had implemented the Inquisition, which was a state policy of forced conversion of Jews and Muslims to Roman Catholicism, Many Muslims and Jews, if they did not apostate from their faith and accept Roman Catholicism, they were either tortured, imprisoned or killed. So there was a mass exodus of Jews leaving Muslim Spain. Who was it that sent rescue ships to the Iberian Peninsula to bring the Jews of Muslim Spain into their lands? It was none other than the Ottomans. They had no reason to do this. Muslim Spain was not within their domains. Why did they feel the need to send rescue ships to Jews who were facing exile or death? Yet they welcomed them with open arms and they flourished within the Ottoman state for over 400 years to the extent that there are still Jewish quarters in Istanbul and other parts of Turkey. There was even poetry written by the Ottomans mocking the, the, the Castilians in Spain saying how crazy, I'm paraphrasing, how crazy and how strange it is that you exile a people who brought nothing but benefit to your communities and your societies, we will happily welcome them. When there was the great famine in Ireland, round about the 1860s, 1850s, and it got to an extent where thousands of people in Ireland were dying out of starvation, who was it that sent a ship full of aid to the Irish? It was none other than the Ottoman Khalif Abdul Majid the first Rahimahullah. I then ask you again, what was the need for him to send a ship of aid to the Irish who forget about they weren't even within his domains, they weren't even within his proximity. 
Yet he felt the need when he heard the news that there were thousands of people, children, women, elderly, dying of hunger. He sent a ship of 10,000 pounds worth of aid at that time. It was intercepted by Queen Victoria because she was embarrassed. She goes, how can the Caliph of the Muslims send more aid than me? I only sent 2,000. So she intercepted that ship and forced the Ottomans to just give 1,000 pounds worth of aid. So it didn't embarrass her. When it was a manufactured famine by the English at the time. Brothers and sisters, these were just some examples from Islamic history. These were just some examples where the concept of justice had manifested consistently throughout our civilization. But at the same time, I encourage you all and I strongly advise you all that when we engage and discuss Islamic history and Islamic civilization, that we do not present it as a utopian society. Because it wasn't. Islamic history had many instances of shortcomings, of unjust rulers, of civil wars, of power disputes, of the incorrect implementation of the sacred law. We had all of that, without a shadow of a doubt. However, when we discuss Islamic history and Islamic civilization, never ever fall into the trap of likening it to European colonialism or the conventional understanding of empires. Let me explain to you why that is. When you look at the lands in which Islam reached and Muslims had ruled, you'll find in many cases that Muslims were ruling as minorities. And there was no state policy of forced conversions. It was unheard of. It was unheard of. When Islam came to Egypt, and when it came to Syria, when it went to Central Asia, when it went to India, when it went to uh, uh, the Balkans, you'll find that Muslims were in many cases ruling as minorities. The Mughals who had ruled India, they were, they'd never even claimed to be a caliphate or an Islamic dynasty. Even then they did not enforce Islam upon the majority Hindu population. Islam in India had always been a faith and a system of the minorities. The same with the West African Muslim kingdoms of the Bantus and the Fulani people. It was Muslim kings that were essentially ruling over a majority non-Muslim population. In the Balkans, it was predominantly Ottoman Muslim rulers that were ruling amongst a majority Christian population. Right? This is why when you go to these lands today, you will still find Yazidis, uh, um, Druze, Coptics, Maronites. You will still see these people and these communities preserved because, Allah, because the Islam had afforded that security and that preservation of these respective peoples. We also have to look at how the Byzantine Empire or the many kingdoms of medieval Europe and even the dawn of European colonialism, what kind of effect did that have when it went to other parts of the world? How did the Europeans deal with the native indigenous people of North, Africa, uh, North America? How did Christopher Columbus deal with the people of Mexico and the, and the West Indies? How did the British deal with the Aboriginal people of Australia? It was mass genocide. Mass genocide. The BBC carried out a research, which they published last year, and said that the death and the pillage of the indigenous people of North America was so intense. It was so bad that it had an effect on the climate and the weather of all the diseased bodies. Then what followed genocide was forced conversions. And we can see that. Those of you who are from Africa, if you look at African history and see which countries today identify as predominantly Christian, it is those countries that had not accepted Islam remained as indigenous peoples of those lands until the Europeans arrived. I challenge anyone to give me an example. Give me an example from history for 14 centuries where when Muslims entered a land that there was a, a, a state policy of forced conversions. You won't find it. You'll find an invitation to Islam. You'll find certain policies and laws which according to the Sharia may be perceptively seen as favoring Muslims over the Dhimmis. That could be argued to some degree if you look at it from a secular point of view. But you find it very difficult to find an example where any dynasty or any emirate or any caliphate throughout 14 centuries had a policy of forced conversions. 
The reason why I had to make this comparison is because we're living at a time where, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, where Muslims are experiencing a plethora of external pressures. Within the psyche and the mindset of Muslims, we have been besieged by an inferiority complex. And it can even be argued that it was inevitable. 20 years of the war on terror, 20 years of state Islamophobia, wars, occupation and so forth in the Muslim world, it's just been relentless. And naturally when a faith community finds itself in the situation that we do today, we will start questioning our own deen, we'll start questioning our own moral compass, and then we'll start seeking answers elsewhere. Therefore, it is absolutely important, brothers and sisters, that we have more events like this. More events where we talk about these controversial issues, because they're not actually controversial. They've been made controversial. And that if we don't start educating one another and start seeking education in these topics, how else are we going to be able to defend it and articulate it and convey the truth? I want to conclude by another piece of advice. One which I alluded to earlier on in my talk. Whether it be the concept of justice, equal rights, women's rights, marital rights, property rights, whatever concept it may be within Islam which is increasingly being scrutinized in today's times, that it is very easy to seek a justification and explanation from outside of the framework and the paradigm of Islam. It is very easy to seek solutions and answers beyond the Qur'an and Sunnah because it is presented as something, again, as archaic, as outdated, that requires reformation, that requires for it to conform to the predominant secular liberal values of today. But this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous because it, it never really happened for 14 centuries. And this century and the ones to follow are no different. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Islam is a very robust faith. It is here for all times and all peoples. Hence why it flourished for over a millennia. This is the testimony of non-Muslim academics and historians who, one after another, whether they are talking about Muslim Spain, whether they're talking about Abbasid Mesopotamia, whether they're talking about Umayyad Asham, whether they're talking about Ottoman Europe or Mughal India, or Bantu or Fulani West Africa, over a thousand years, Islam flourished when it, was, when it manifested comprehensively. That there was no issue with the advancement of intellectual studies, whether it be geometry, math, science. That Islam and Islamic civilization was flourishing at a time where there was barely any lighting and drainage system in, in Europe. Where women, forget about being seen as second class citizens, they were seen as witches, right, in medieval Europe. So we need to instill within ourselves this confidence. Because wallahi, if we start adopting ideas and adopting justifications from beyond our tradition, we will find ourselves in a very dire state. If we do not instill within ourselves a sense of confidence, right? And remove this obstacle of fear from our mindset, right? We are setting a dangerous precedent for the future generations of Muslims. Can I see a show of hands to see whose parents originate from Asia? Whose parents originate from the Middle East? Whose parents originate from Africa? That's practically everyone. If our forefathers and our predecessors were people who did not have courage, were people who were consumed by fear, Wallahi, Islam would not have reached you. It would not have reached your predecessors and your forefathers. We are living at a very unique time, brothers and sisters. A very unique time. I believe that future generations will come and they will look back at the many struggles that this generation is facing and the struggles of the last 80 to 100 years. And they will look back at this generation with envy and jealousy in that how we managed our affairs at such difficult times. I want to conclude this talk on a very promising hadith. There are its authenticity is disputed amongst the scholars and there are various narrations and versions of it. In a gathering, the Prophet ﷺ told his companions that there will come a time, there will come a time, a group of Muslims after us, 
and they will be my beloved. The companions were baffled. They were like, Ya Rasulullah, how can they be your beloved? Were we not the ones who fought alongside you? Were we not the ones who abandoned our families and were with you shoulder to shoulder throughout this struggle? He said, no, you are my companions, but they are my beloved. Because this generation of Muslims will come at a time, in one hadith it says when the Quran has been abandoned, in another variation when they are surrounded by enemies who are seeking to oppress them. And they are my beloved. I don't know about you all brothers and sisters, I would like to be in that honorable camp in the hereafter, inshallah. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every single person in this room is a contributor and a protagonist for positive change in society. I mean, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all oppressed people, Muslim and non-Muslims all around the world who are facing hardship and difficulties as a result of the policies and systems which seek to oppress them, that they are, that, that difficulty is uplifted and is replaced by a, by a system which is just and one which takes into accordance our Creator and His revelation. Amin Ya Rabb. Jazakumullah khair.